Hello and welcome to chapter 7 of our discussion and analysis of Wuthering Heights as we go through chapter by chapter. One thing I'm going to say, I'm going to say, I normally say it at the end, but like, comment, subscribe, notification bell, all those things. Because when I check the stats, there's lots of people watching who aren't subscribed. So please do so if you haven't done so. That sounds quite neat. So let's continue going straight into it. So we had chapter 7 where we will launch straight into things, if I've got the pointer ready, here we go. So, remember that Cathy's had this encounter with the bulldog of Thrushcross Grange, and she's now having to convalesce there as she's healing, because it's a kind of thing that happens in Victorian fiction to female characters. They often end up getting injured and then having the recovery, or, or, or they go out in the rain without a hat on or something like that, and then they have to recover for months afterwards. And there's always an element of suspense about their health as well, because frequently women are depicted as uh, frail beings who need extra recuperation time. So we have that here. So Cathy stayed at Thrushcross Grange five weeks till Christmas. So she's she is healed. She's better. The mistress visited her often in the interval and commenced her plan, a plan of reform by trying to raise her self-respect with fine clothes and flattery. So... What often gets missed out of most versions of it, Frances, this is Frances Earnshaw, the wife of Hindley, she's visiting Catherine in an attempt to train her up to be more of a gentlewoman, basically. And I quite, I've always quite liked that little line there, fine clothes and flattery, which she took readily. So Catherine is responding to this kind of civilization process that she's experiencing. So notice again, Bronte's choice of language here, we've got the idea of civilization versus the 19th century's England's imagination about other parts of the world, like non-Christian parts of the world, like savage, basically. And the idea of a wild, hatless little savage jumping into the house. Sorry, I should have said sorry. So that instead of a wild, hatless little savage jumping into the house, and rushing to squeeze us all breathy, or sorry, breathless even, they're lighted from a handsome black pony, a very dignified person. So Catherine has undergone, a, in effect, a makeover with brown ringlets falling from the cover of a feathered beaver. That's a hat, if anyone's worried about that bit. And a long cloth habit, which she was obliged to hold up with both hands that she might sail in. So she's wearing the clothes of a lady of the time, basically. So she's come back completely transformed some references to Christmas cake that Nellie's been making there that's caught my eye as I was looking at it. It's not particularly relevant, but I felt compelled to say it. Catherine's concerned, obviously, thinking about, is, he is Heathcliff not here, she demanded. Well, remember, Heathcliff has been effectively demoted to the status of a servant. You may come and wish Miss Catherine welcome like the other servants. That's Hindley to Heathcliff. Again, notice his degradation here where he was part of the family but under Hindley's rule he's now been effectively working as a servant shake hands Heathcliff said Mr Earnshaw condescendingly once in a way that is permitted so Bronte's depicting Hindley here effectively this is this is not the old Mr Earnshaw because he's dead this is Hindley Earnshaw how he's kind of abusing his power there once in a way that is permitted I shall not stand to be laughed at I shall not bear it so Heathcliff stands up for himself he doesn't want to be humiliated he's got that level of dignity i shall be as dirty as i please and i like to be dirty and i will be dirty so what you've got here bronte deliberately presents heathcliff as a total opposite of catherine's appearance catherine actually her real nature is she would like to be with heathcliff all the time she probably would like to be like Heathcliff. she'd probably like to be dirty like running out on the moors and everything just with him you know heathcliff's dirt is from work but there's a deliberate juxtaposition, so they're presented in this kind of basically antithetical way, where they're, one is being one has been reduced to savagery, effectively, as nineteenth-century readers would think about it. He's kind of reduced; he looks more kind of primitive and wild, whereas Catherine is now looking like the very embodiment of nineteenth-century gentlewoman, basically. And we have about. Nelly here, on, all on her own, working away, preparing for Christmas, singing Christmas carols, and Joseph, the miserable old so-and-so, 
he basically, Joseph, dismisses them as being too fun, basically, because he is such a miserable so-and-so, as we've previously seen. So we have... Make haste, Heathcliff, I said. The kitchen is so comfortable and Joseph is upstairs. Make haste and let me dress you smart before Miss Cathy comes out. And then you can sit together with the whole hearth of yourselves and have a long chat until bedtime. So when everyone's gone to bed, see, this is Nellie. Again, she's an unreliable narrator, but she's also quite inconsistent as a character as well. Because you can see here, she's basically facilitating Catherine and Heathcliff being together. When obviously Hindley doesn't want that to happen. So in other times, you get... Nelly criticising Heathcliff and also Catherine as well. So she actually does set it up, but Heathcliff doesn't actually do any of this. She's also given him a bit of Christmas cake. I like this book. His cake and cheese remained on the table all night for the fairies. So in Yorkshire, there is a tradition of having, it's not cheddar cheese. It'll be like Wensleydale cheese as loved by Wallace and Gromit. One of those Wallace and Gromit cheeses. Where um, you've got a, they would eat it with Christmas cake. I've tried this as a Wuthering Heights based experiment, and it's actually quite nice. It does work, but it's got to be Wensleydale cheese, like your normal cheddar just won't cut it. If you get my drift, the he managed to continue work till nine o'clock, then marched dumb and dour to his chamber. So you've got a difference here between the attitudes of Catherine and Heathcliff. But it's, of course it's easy, easy for Catherine because she's effectively kind of elevated socially here in this respect. So for some reason here, my annotations have disappeared, but I've redone them and they've magically reappeared now. So we have Bronte again establishing the closeness of Heathcliff and Catherine, even though they've not been together. That Nellie tells us both of them have been upset about not being able to see the other. Well, I cried last night, he returned, and I had more reason to cry than she. Then, this is interesting as well, because it's if you're exploring issues to do with ethnicity and prejudice, and this is about Edgar Linton, but Nelly, if I knocked him down 20 times, that wouldn't make him less handsome or me more so, because Nelly says, oh, you're much kind of stronger, you're more of a man than he is. But look at this. I wish I had light hair and a fair skin and was dressed and behaved as well and had a chance of being as rich as he will be. A couple of things going on. First of all, thinking about that sense of cultural prejudice as well against someone who's darker. This is 19th century England as well. So they're associating light hair and fair skin with goodness, which you still see to the present day with things like you know, obviously, like Goldilocks is one, but obviously that's an older text in itself. But a lot of these ideas are perpetuated in it, it, it's it's there are some attempts to counteract this, but it's far from universal if you look at it. So if you think about a lot of a lot of characters, there's a generally a likeness. So even what did I see? This is a Smurfs film where Smurfette is when she's good, she's blonde and when she's bad, she's got dark hair, you know, so it's even into things like that. So you know what I mean? There's this going back a long time. There's this cultural association with fairness equals goodness and fairness equals lightness, and you could say fairness equals lightness equals whiteness. You can put it all together like that. But also the other thing that's going on here is that there's also foreshadowing of Heathcliff's wealth as well. Heathcliff won't only be as rich as Edgar Linton. He's going to be richer than Edgar Linton. So again, that's foreshadowing there. We've already seen the wealthy Heathcliff, so we know that that's actually going to come true because of Bronte's unusual structure of the novel with the framing narrative as well. So let's go on to the next page. Oh, this one's not been deleted. That's good. So you have more of the same ideas here. In other words, I must wish for Edgar Linton's great blue eyes and even forehead. So this links to 19th century idea, ideas about um, physiognomy which is an unusual word, but it's, I won't spell it out, but if you look it up, it's to do, I'll tell you the definition of it, and then you'll be able to find it anyway. But the idea of Victorians, and this is actually, yeah, Victorians is just about early days of Victorian novel, but Victorians had this cultural idea of, you could guess someone's personality from their facial features. And this was also used in a racist way as well. It was used in a way to justify the British Empire as well, like bringing civilization to the world. And if you had certain features, it meant that you were instantly more primitive. They also thought that you'd be more likely to commit a crime if your eyes were closer together and things like that. 
it, it's just a widely held there's absolutely there's nothing in it as i'm sure you've guessed already it's a pseudoscience but it was widely believed in victorian times as having scientific fact behind it and it's it's a load of load of rubbish but you can see echoes of it here and again look more more uh issues of race and ethnicity here a good heart will help you to a bonny face, my lad. I continued, so that's nearly. If you were a regular black and a bad one will turn the bonniest into something worse than ugly. So this is one of those things where it's it's kind of accepting, but it's also, it's, it's in some ways it's a little bit, in some ways it's progressive, but it's also kind of racist at the same time, because if you were a regular black, uh, yeah, this is, this is very, yeah, this isn't very comfortable to read, but you look at it. So she's saying that even if you were darker, it would actually be, this is how I interpret it anyway, it's a good heart that really matters. But you can tell there is a bit of racism in there, but it's meant to be a positive message for Heathcliff if you were a regular black. And again, their knowledge, the character's knowledge of ethnicity, race in here, it's very vague and imprecise so it's open to your interpretation but i find that but she is basically saying you know it's what what's inside that counts which is a good message but that's it's mixed with again prejudices of the era coming through there as well you're fit for a prince in disguise so there's there's more positivity here from nelly as a character so bondi said that you're who knows that your father was emperor of china and your mother an indian queen so you can see from this, on one hand, it's meant to be supportive and morale boosting, effectively, for Heathcliff. But it's also very kind of vague and imprecise, and it shows a lack of knowledge about ethnicity and ideas. But it's meant to be positive. Were I in your place, I would frame high notions of my birth, and the thoughts of what I was should give me courage and dignity to support the oppressions of a little farmer. So again, whereas you do get the prejudice from Nellie, look how she's also supportive of Heathcliff, kind of paradoxically as well, and she means a little farmer. That is deliberate, deliberate litotes, actually, deliberate understatement, litotes, opposite of hyperbole, of describing the status of Hindley Earnshaw. So she does actually make him feel happier there as well. Then... We have the encounter where Edgar Linton mocks Heathcliff when they're preparing the food and everything. And Heathcliff sees the tureen of hot apple sauce, the first thing that came under his grip, and dashed it full against the speaker's face and neck. So he hurls that in Edgar Linton's face. And he, I think he deserves it, doesn't he? I think it's hard not to agree there. So Mr. Earnshaw punishes Heathcliff there as well. And then this is nasty because this bit, Heathcliff is then punished by Earnshaw, Hindley Earnshaw. That brute of a lad has warned me nicely. Next time, Master Edgar, take the law into your own fist. It will give you an appetite. So Hindley has physically assaulted Heathcliff as a punishment. So they're having this Christmas. This, this is not the, the best Christmas party anyone's ever seen is it really then how lightly she dismisses her old playmate's troubles i could not have imagined her to be so selfish so that is nelly's reflections on catherine's apparent lack of empathy for Heathcliff's situation so what's happened is is that her cultivation at thrushcross grange she's now adapting adapt, sorry adopting this supercilious this this sense of superiority over others and this ingrained awareness of class and status that you have in English society in the era. So I'm going to move on to the next page. Heathcliff vows for revenge. I'm trying to settle how I shall pay Hindley back. I don't care how long I wait. If I can only do it at last, I hope he will not die before I do. For shame, Heathcliff said I, is for God to punish wicked people. We should learn to forgive. No, God won't have the satisfaction that I that I shall, he returned. I only wish I knew the best way. Let me in and I'll plan it out. While I'm thinking of that, I don't feel pain. So he doesn't feel the punishment. So he's planning his revenge. But notice again, a lot of uh, recurring theme in the novel about anti 
Christian ideas. So Heathcliff isn't satisfied with the idea of God punishes wicked people and humans. Our role is to forgive following the teachings of Jesus. But basically for Heathcliff, no, God won't have the satisfaction I have. I want to punish him myself. So there's plenty of this recurring theme where Christian ideas and teachings are turned on their head in the novel. We've seen it lots of times. There's lots of times, even in the locations of Thrushcross Grange and Wuthering Heights as well. Then I could have told Heathcliff's history all that you need here in half a dozen words. Well, we're lucky that she doesn't really, because there wouldn't be as much of the novel. But you might feel differently if you don't. I, I, I love it. I did like Wuthering Heights the first time I read it. It took me a while to get into. And then from the, that point on, on a second reading, I thought, ah, yes, I get it. And I understand it and I like it. And so, but it took me a second reading to really appreciate it. I think it's the complexity. I think that stops people from getting into it. Anyway, I'm going off on the sideline here. So this again reminds us of the frame narrative as well, where we've got Nellie is talking to Lockwood, telling him the whole story. Do sit still another half hour. He wants to hear more of the story. Then... Lockwood, we get a sense of Lockwood's lifestyle. He's living the dream here. I'm not accustomed to go to bed in the long hours. One or two is early enough for a person who lies till 10. So he tends to go to bed at about one o'clock or two o'clock at night and stays in bed till 10 in the morning. So that doesn't that say a lot about Lockwood's own status and class that he's obviously extremely wealthy. He hasn't get up. He hasn't got to get up in the morning to go to work or do anything in particular. He can stay in bed to 10 and that's his normal. That's his normal time for getting up. So if he's out on a big night out, I'd expect you wouldn't see him until the afternoon, I would guess. So, but there's a contrast here between that refined, wealthy, presumably southern life of Lockwood with the rural life of the people of the area of Wuthering Heights, which is really, well, Gimmerton is the name of the place, isn't it, overall? A person who has not done half his day's work by 10 o'clock runs a chance of leaving the other half undone. This could be perceived, actually, you could look at the implication of it from, from Nelly and by extension Bronte criticising this kind of wealthy class, this very indolent class of people, you know, people who just effectively don't do anything. They're just wealthy. They just have fun all the time. They just do what they want to do. They don't know a day's hard work. It could be seen as a little bit of a dig, couldn't it? It could actually be seen as a criticism, actually. So he wants to hear he wants to hear more of the story. You must now allow me to leap over some three years. No, no, I'll allow nothing of the sort. We're going to get all the detail instead because we get this framing mechanism. Then accepting a few provincialisms of slight consequence, you have no marks of the manners which I am habituated to consider as peculiar to your class. So another theme of the novel, another recurring theme of the novel are ideas about class and judgments about class. And so he's saying you seem a bit more... There's more about you. You're more, more refined than other people of your class. This could be the first servant that Lockwood's ever had a proper conversation with or even treated as an equal in many ways. Not exactly an equal, but talk to them at least as a fellow human being. I'm sure you have thought a great deal more than the generality of servants think. You have been compelled to cultivate your reflective faculties for want of occasions for frittering your life away in silly trifles. So notice again Lockwood's pompous style that Bronte gives him as well. Nelly, I have read more than you would fancy, Mr Lockwood. So she's self-educated. She's been reading a lot of the books, old books that belong to Edgar Linton and his father before him. She's been reading them, not the ones that are in Greek and Latin, because then again, that's a class thing where if you were more educated, if you were probably privately educated, you'd know latin and greek in that era but she's read all the stuff in english so in some ways this is what you've got is emily bronte is effectively contextualizing why nelly is able to retain all this information and tell this story so well because she's not quite like a normal servant she's self-educated and she's self-taught so it's a good one for class as well Again, she's still unreliable, though. You can't completely trust everything that Nellie's saying because she's someone who's involved in the story in it herself. But I find that interesting. But she goes on to the next summer. It's going to be 1778. Obviously, the novel was written 
later than the novel is set. So just bear that in mind as well. So I'm going to stop there. We covered some good stuff there. I hope you enjoyed that. I'm going to repeat my message about liking, commenting, subscribing. Watch and listen to my other videos as well. I hope you find them useful. And I will see you on the next one. Goodbye.